Hi. <laughs> Is anybody there? Um, hello, everyone. It is. Uh, it's it's Thursday. Um, I apologize. I feel like I haven't slept properly in a few days. So, if um, if this is slightly, I don't know. Well, it's never that organized. But if it's maybe less organized than normal, then um, I apologize. But uh, awesome book, Breasts and Eggs. Um, first of all, thank you so much to everybody for really amazing and insightful and really thoughtful questions and comments. And I kind of wish that this was a book where we were all in a room discussing together. And it's made me think even more that when all this craziness is over, let's let's have in-person book clubs once in a while. That would be, I think, pretty good. Um, so first of all, um, this was such a, a surprising book. I knew nothing about it, pretty much. Um, lots of people asked me why I chose it. Um, I was working um, with this amazing Japanese um, hair and makeup artist, uh, Wakana, um, a couple of months ago, and we were talking about books, and we were. T I was asking her about Japanese artists or writers, and. Um, she suggested this and then I went into bookstore in London and there it was and I, I am a sucker for a good cover. This is definitely a good cover. Um, and I just, I like to discover new writers and new, I don't know, from places. I mean, I, I read quite a few Japanese authors, but never a female Japanese author before. Um, so I was very, uh, happy to read this. And yeah, I think the things that struck me, um, the anger in it, the humor in it, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, sometimes you have to do mental gymnastics. <laughs> You're like, oh, I've never actually thought of that. And some of her, some of the characters' views on things were so... I mean, not extreme. I mean, some, yeah, some of them were extreme, but like so passionately held and made me think of a lot of things in ways that I'd never thought before, whether I agreed with them or not. But um, yeah, so um, yeah, so lots and lots of amazing questions, lots of long questions. <laughs> um, so I have distilled some of them and um, obviously quite a few of them are repetitive not repetitive, but like lots of people have asked the same thing. So I've sort of um, collated some of those. Um, I can't see what people are saying otherwise uh, or also. So um, none of us have slept well in the past couple of days. Good. So I'm not alone then. I think everybody's um, in this same crazy place uh, together. Um, okay, so... The first question, which I thought was really interesting and not one that, not one that I, I, I so I'll sort of, it is from Anna, Bia and Juliana or Juliana, I don't know. Um, but they had a couple of questions, but the one part that was sort of unique that I hadn't heard other people sort of discuss as much um, was about the language and the translation um, and I, I did kind of think this as I was reading the book and I, I wished that I could read it in Japanese because, you know, I often wonder about a translation and, and often then you'll see a book that comes out like 15 or 20 years later, there'll be a brand new translation by somebody else and everyone will be like, this is really what the author was trying to get across. And I think that it's such an amazing, you know, we're so lucky as English speakers, that so much literature is written in English and you get to read all of that. But when you read an author's work who writes in another language, I, I, you know, it's such a loss, I think, that we don't get that original voice and the original 
thoughts because you know no matter how well you understand a language to be able to transpose someone's thoughts such a difficult thing I mean we all know that like when you're trying to explain to somebody exactly what you are trying to get across um and they had a question about the fact that it was two different translators I guess the first part of the book was written or was translated by um one guy and the second part of the book was translated by another guy and their question was also sort of about the fact that there's two male translators on what is arguably a very, very female-centric and feminist book. And, you know, I think you can't, we can't say that because you're a man, you aren't capable of doing this. Um, I don't think that that's fair to say in any way or shape or means, but I do wonder especially because it deals with feminine or female interior life and um, the different phases of development as a woman. I, I do wonder, <laughs> I would be very curious to know what a translation by a female author would be like. And actually, and there was one article that I, I had looked up and I guess um, because the first part of the book was written as a novella back in 2008 or something like that, there was a woman, Louise Heal Kawaii, who had translated or translated an excerpt. And so there was they had written some of her lines and what the guys had written. And it was quite shocking, the difference, um, because she had also, I guess, put the Osaka dialect almost as um, Liverpudlian, I think it was, so or Mancunian, and it was just this very different and very much um, looser and f more free version of the language. And so, uh, yeah, I, I would be very curious if in a couple of years there's not another translation by somebody else, and I would be quite curious to to read that. So that's a yeah, that's a good question, ladies. Thank you. Um, but so lots of people, I mean, there's so much in this book. I mean, you know, I think it's very strange in its structure and lots of people were asking how I felt about that. And I think I it, almost by accident, I had read the first almost about five pages before the end of the first book. And then I had put it down for a couple of days and then I went back to it. And so I read it in a bit of a disjointed way. So it didn't bother me, you know, that kind of change in tone so much. Um, but it was interesting how her internal life had changed so much. You know, I think, it, and, and the difference also of getting this very intense experience over a couple of days, which was so, um, not a couple of days, but really the, the bulk of the action takes over that kind of, visit from Makiko and Midori or Midoriko um, and and then to then go into this much sort of ex more expansive especially in her internal I suppose in her confusion as well it was just you know she was less sure of who she was at this other phase of her life and it was I, I don't know I thought it was really interesting the way that she had done it and very interesting that an author would take up that challenge to revisit work and like do this whole other kind of novel that sits on top of it in such an interesting way. Um, okay, so let's go to that. I always get, I get to a point where I'm like chatting and then I'm like, and here I am talking to myself again. Um, so this question is from Ang Sup. Seven. I can't read my own writing. Um, page 271. Yeah, so I think her question was about... Sorry, I'm reading my own writing for a second. Um... I think her question was sort of about the the um, 
The expectation in Japanese society about women having kids, and I think, you know, so much of this book and so much that shocked and surprised me about this book was the still very conservative and traditional views on female fertility and family structure. Um, you know, I've been to Japan twice. The first time was in 1999 um, and the second time was in 2006. And at that point, you know, I could see that it was quite a patriarchal society, um, especially the first time I was there and um, women's roles and all of that, you know, it, it was very much... Um, females were considered sort of less than the male members of society. Um, and you could see it in working environments. At least that was my experience. It was quite um, obvious. But I was very shocked to learn that single women could not um, have IVF if they wanted to have their own child or neither could same-sex couples, which, you know, we think of, I think of Japan as quite a progressive society in most other ways. And so I was very, very shocked to learn that that was still the case. Um, and then, you know, this idea that, I mean, I feel like it permeates, you know, the anger that permeates through this book about women's roles and like where, where their place is in society and then what falls on them. And, um, this was the quote that she was sort of uh, talking about. Um, and it was Sen Sengawa um, saying, kids, ha, it's not like I've ever been strongly against having kids or anything. Not really. It's more like I was living life. I never really saw an opening. No time ever came when I could imagine adding kids to the mix. There was too much going on. And then how she's, you know, that's such an outlier that she had to make a choice of just career and then that was it because she didn't sort of fall into this family structure and you know it's it's really it's really interesting then that all of the families that we hear about are the majority of the kids that there are the people when they talk about their childhoods they're all raised by single women so it's this idea that a man needs to be there in the structure of a family and you need to have this male-female unit and create a child out of love and in a traditional sense, yet the minute the child is born, all of that goes out the window because the man can leave and the woman has to raise the kid by themselves or, you know, in some tragic circumstances, the, the parent dies or whatever it is. And it's just this very... So this was a narrow view of what creates or what consists of a family. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I could, <laughs> I wish somebody was talking back to me. Um, but, uh, okay, so we'll, we'll move on because I know we're going to go back to all of that because that's such a big part of the book um, and it comes up again and again. Um, but Angie M. N. Y. C. Um, she her question was about how a culture can impact views of what is considered beautiful, and she asked about how my travel has influenced that and what has been my experience. Um, well, I think that that's the beauty of travel, is that you get to experience that everywhere you go, there are different ideals of beauty. And I feel so fortunate that I got to experience that at quite a young age. Um, not as young as some. I never left Ireland until I was older than 17. But um, I think it was so important. Like that was one of the good balances to being a model and getting to travel as a model was that at least I was getting this information from other places that was expanding my um, view on that kind of thing. And I remember going to Japan in 1999 and how it was changing a lot at that point there because up until that point, Western beauty was very much held in a higher esteem. And, you know, they used to 
models would go there and make so much money because they would go over for contracts and um, they were given all the most lucrative jobs. But that was stopping at that point and you saw more and more Japanese girls being appreciated and the Japanese look being appreciated and um, as it should be. Um, and it was good to see that change, but, you know, beauty ideals, it's still... I mean, so much of this book as well is about this, these self-imposed or societal-imposed ideals of what beauty should be. I mean, it's... Um, we'll, I'll go to sort of the next question because it deals with this. But Kelly E. Austin was talking about how two women, Midoriko and Makiko, um, they... I'm going to try and read my own writing... Um, they demonstrate different forms of self-loathing at opposite ends of the female experience. Midoriko hating that her body is becoming more feminine and Makiko hating that she isn't sexy or feminine enough. And I think that this is the kind of crazy thing that women are subjected to. And I, and I was thinking about this in, in a way with this book, you know, this ever-changing battle we seem to have with our own bodies and our own phases in life as women um, and there's, I remember reading, um, I, somebody bought me the autobiography of a, of an author and journalist called Gail Sheehy. I don't know if anybody knows her. She, um, is a New York journalist and writer and she has all these different books about the phases of life as women, of women. And it's very interesting. You know, we, we sort of, as do boys go through this very kind of crazy time in your puberty and your body's changing and you don't know what's going on and you know I think it was so beautifully expressed with Midoriko how confusing and how scary that can be and you know this this sort of competition and competitiveness among young girls but also the fear of like oh well who's got their period who hasn't got their period do you want to get your period <laughs> is it scary to get your period and then it just you know all of that and your body changing and your hormones changing. But then, you know, for men, they sort of go through puberty and then that's sort of it, you know, then they're just, they're done and then they just get older. But we then have to consider this whole thing about your fertility and your, you know, your, your clock <laughs> and all of that. And then, you know, all of that. And then it's like menopause. And then, you know, you've got all the aging stuff on top of that. And it's, it's really such a shame that we don't, I don't know, educate ourselves more about that. I mean, somebody, I, I keep jumping around all these questions because somebody else um, asked, oh, this is also part of this. Um, Fontis Gabby um, was sort of talking about the importance of sex education in schools um, because I think in Brazil there there's a lot of controversy happening right now where they're trying to, I don't take it out of schools. Is that what's happening? Um, and, and you know, I went to an Irish, it wasn't a Catholic school, but I, I it was predominantly Catholic. Um, I didn't get any sex education at all at school. Um, and I think from what I know, I mean, I could be very wrong, but I think sex education is very, very minuscule in most schools. And it's basically the most basic mechanics and it doesn't talk about you know consent or pleasure or all of these differing emotions and things that are going on in your life and it's like how amazing would it be if you know there was proper dialogue about all of that and and people didn't have to be so scared um that would be amazing um this is going to be very scatty tonight. I'm very sorry. It's also, it's 20 past nine and um, yeah, I hope it's okay. Um, how do I see the most recent comments? I'm just going to like, just going to say hi to some people. Um, but uh, what else are we talking about here? I wrote lots of notes. I just can't remember any of it. <laughs> um, okay. 
let's go to this was a lot of people by the way i want to say a huge thank you because a lot of people shared a lot of really um lovely and but also quite private and personal information about their experiences with many things that this that are reflected in this book and i just want to thank people for their bravery and for their um sharing and i know it can't be easy and you know i hope that when we all collectively read together and share things like this you know we all get to feel like we're part of this community and in some ways um i hope that's a bit of a comfort to people too um but uh maybe elizabeth bridget 1591 um i think this is probably the most shocking passage of the book for me um was Yuriko when she's talking to um, Natsuke about her questioning her why she wanted to have a child and her just the pain with which she was speaking from was something that was really, really um, palpable and very hard to read, but also her adamance that sorry I'm not even drinking gin tonight it's been a long week so this is ginger kombucha I apologize I'm such a lightweight I know there's many people who are going to be very disappointed in me um but uh yeah the fact that she was so adamant about the selfishness of bringing a child into the world and exposing a being to the pain of life and you have to think about god how hard her life must be for her to feel that and to have lost all hope but then it also makes you think about you know this idea of why we want children and and you know, you look at the world and you look at like how the environment and so many things are so messed up and the world's so overpopulated and you're like, oh, wow, are we all just really selfish? But, um, you know, I think uh, I think it's anyway, I'm going to read a little bit about it because I think it's quite, um, quite powerful and quite also quite harsh. Like the I think that's the thing, like just. It was so, I don't know, it's so full on. It was, uh, let me see if I can find my notes. Look, I'm not saying it's a little different for children of donors. It's not okay to set them or the entire family up for a future of counseling and therapy, but it's basically the same for everyone. That's what it's like to be born. If you stop and think about it, that's all life ever is. Like I was saying, the way you do it doesn't matter. What I'm asking is, why do you want to bring a child into this world? What would possess you to do that? I was quiet. Let me guess, Yuriko said quietly. You think giving birth is some kind of miracle, the gift of life. I don't understand. I'm sure you've given a lot of thought to how you, to how to have your baby, but have you really ever thought about what that really means? I looked at my own knees in silence. What if you have a child and that child wishes with every bone in her body that she'd never been born? Eureka stared at her fingers. When I say this sort of thing, people always feel sorry for me. Poor you, you never knowing your real parents living through years of abuse. No wonder you can't find anything good in life. I can see the pity on your faces. Sometimes they'll tell me it's not my fault, tell me it's never too late. They'll start crying and hug me. They'll look in my eye and say I can turn things around. They're good, kind-hearted people, she said. Here's the thing, though. I, generally, I genuinely don't think I've had a bad life. I don't need anyone's pity. Whatever it is I've had to live through, it's nothing compared to being born. Um, it's like... Quite nihilistic and I can't say that I agree with her at all um, but yeah it's it was quite shocking this kind of 
uh, manifesto about her thoughts on that stuff. But then, you know, I think part of the question some of the people who had asked about this was, you know, whether they thought Kawakami was saying that somehow people who go through IVF are selfish or this idea of people wanting to have a child even if they couldn't, um, whether that, whether she was making some comment on that. And I really don't think she was. And I really don't think that that's what she's saying. I think that she's trying to expose the hypocrisy sort of in Japanese culture and um, that you know, people make judgments on people and make judgments on their journeys and and they shouldn't because they don't know what their journey is. And, you know, I, I think this idea that it then comes out later and I think it's beautiful that Aizawa, you know, he starts off saying that he felt that he was just a part of a procedure and that like one half of him didn't exist because of being part of a donor, but that he be does come to the realization that through healing, actually what he was looking for was forgiveness and love and being able to connect to his real father, who even though he wasn't his biological father, he was his real father. Um, and I think that it goes through such a harsh journey. I think it's it's sometimes hard to see that um, part at the end. And I think some people were like, "Wait, is this what she's sort of saying?" But I don't think that I don't think that that's what she um, meant at all. Um, so thirty six U's said. Um, that she read this in Japanese and I am so jealous <laughs> that you did. Um, and actually I would love to hear from somebody who's, I don't know, who can read both Japanese and English um, if they even read different excerpts of the book and what they felt was the difference in experience of reading it in both. That would be really interesting to know. Um, let me... There are lots of circumstances, hold on. Oh, somebody is saying something and you are absolutely right. Um, somebody is saying there's lots of circumstances where the man, father, dad becomes a single parent and it's not fair to assume that the children always stay with the mother. 100% agree. I was just talking in the context of the book of the characters that they were um, dealing with because they do deal pretty much exclusively with single moms, but a hundred percent stand corrected and I agree. Um, somebody's saying fuck COVID, wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> um, uh, I never know which way the questions come in. Like somebody needs to give me a proper tutorial. Um, somebody's saying, uh, sorry. I believe she felt betrayed by the many changes in her body changing from a child to a woman. That's Midoriko. Yeah, well, I think it. that's the thing. It can be a very scary time for a young woman or a young boy, um, puberty and and. I think, yeah, and this is the other thing that one of the big topics in the book is poverty and how that affects all of the characters. And I think it's it's something that was obviously very prevalent throughout. And um, obviously the book starts off with um, how can you tell if someone's poor? Ask them how many windows they had. Um, and this theme of even when Natsu makes money, she doesn't change how she lives because she's sort of under this constant threat of poverty. But I think also you see Makiko is hugely affected by it and it affects, I think, her relationship with Midoriko and this thing that because obviously she loves her daughter so much, but she is 
always been. I mean, when her mother died and she had to take care of Natsu, she has always been this worker and she's just had to struggle and fight and the luxury of sort of having time to take out of her work to sort of address her daughter and, and do all that. I mean, it's, uh, that's, I mean, I'm not, I don't know, that's sort of maybe a bit of a messy thought, but um, it just feels that so many of the characters in this book are just clinging on and just getting by the best they can. Um, and so it's just so sad when you see Midoriko when she decides to stop talking. And the, the violence of that act in an emotional way, that silence, it's just, yeah, um, we should... It was just really difficult to... Uh, I can't imagine how you would cope with that. I'm so sorry. I'm like rambling. I'm so tired. Um, let's see some other questions. If anyone has some. Um... What's your opinion? Is it selfish to be a mother? No, I don't think so. That's not what I was saying at all. I uh, I think it's it was interesting to read Yuriko's comment on that. And as I said, I don't agree with it, but it's... in If you think about us as a, as a race, the human race, our incessant desire to procreate when we consume so many of the earth's resources and like what is the end you know we just <laughs> keep on it's just it's an interesting thought to kind of explore but I don't I don't think that that's a, a selfish act no um What's everyone else saying? All right. Um, so also one of my favorite parts of the book. I loved this whole kind of... There was a beautiful scene um, with Natsu and Midoriko on the Ferris wheel. It was I mean, I also think that whole Eureka part was also one of my favorite just because it was so, for a writer to sort of go down that very dark path <laughs> and um, yeah, for a character to just sort of commit so strongly to an idea that's not obviously quite popular or um, yeah, I think, but Anyway, I digress. Um, I'm trying to... Ooh, is that the wrong... Mm. I'm sorry, I'm losing my mind over here. I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to try and find this bit about the... No. Um, yeah. I can't find it. Okay, I'm going to take two questions from online and then I think I have to call it a night before I embarrass myself anymore. Um... Oh, somebody also asked, um, what is my view of Natsu's search for a suitable donor father? I mean, oh God, that scene was also so horrific when she meets, um, I can't remember his name, I want to say Nando, but 
you know, I, I get, I think it's just shocking that her options were so limited and that this idea that if you were a single woman that you didn't have anywhere to go that was legal and safe and supportive. Um, I think, you know, this is the problem when things are, um, when, you know, these desires aren't going to change. Women aren't just because women are single or men or same sex couples, just because um, somebody says that they don't deserve the right to have a child by themselves or together, that's not going to go away. And this whole idea that you can legislate on people and then that they won't go and try and find another way. All you're doing is making their journey more difficult and more unsafe. And that's what I think happened to Natsu. And it's horrific what happened. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Somebody saying, go to sleep. <laughs> I should. Um, um, one more question. And hi, everybody. Um, okay, what are my thoughts on Midoriko's sections when she would write instead of speak and the effects of that on the other, um, And on the reader, I really, I mean, this is two of the things that I kept flicking and I was like, why have I, why have I <laughs> made a mark and all of that on these? And then I couldn't figure out which question it was related to. Um, but I had, I loved these letters to herself and, um, you know, I journaled so much when I was a teenager and, um, you know, it probably saved me on so many occasions that I was able to sort of offload my my thoughts and it's such a confusing time and you feel so misunderstood and isolated I think a lot um and so I I loved that insight especially when she's not given speech or she's not given any dialogue um this idea that we get her innermost thoughts was a really great um device um so let's should I read a little bit before we before we clock out. <laughs> um, it feels like I'm trapped inside my body. It decides when I get hungry and when I'll get my period. From birth to death, you have to keep eating and making money just to stay alive. And I see what working every night does to my mum. It takes it out of her. But what's it all for? Life is hard enough with just one body. Why would anyone ever want to make another one? I can't even imagine why anyone would bother, but people think it's the best thing ever. Do they, though? I mean... Have they ever really thought about it? When I'm alone and thinking about this stuff, it makes me so sad. At least for me, I know it's not the right thing. Once you get your period, that means your body can fertilize sperm. And that means you can get pregnant. And then we get more people thinking and eating and filling up the world. It's overwhelming. I get a little depressed just thinking about it. I'll never do it. I'll never have children ever. Midoriko. And I think that's the one thing it also shows in the book, it's these changing phases as a woman, you know, how Natsu never even really thought about it until much later. And then it became such a pressing desire for her. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the book and I'm sorry, I'm so spaced out. Um, you know, I, I think this is a really you know, anyone who lives in the States at the moment and lots of us who um, care about what's happening there. I think it's been quite a rough few days for people. And I just want to be, give a big shout out to the women that are in Poland. If anyone's from there, what you guys are going through is so crazy and amazing. And everyone in Brazil, um, you know, I... I think it's more important than ever that we all recognize that the world is so linked and the rights of women and the rights of anyone who has traditionally been left out of the decision-making process or um, 
proper society that we all band together and we try and take care of each other and we try and put out, you know, kindness and love and try and make this place better because some days it gets really, really, um, I don't know. It can feel like it's a, it's a tough battle, but it's nice to know there's so many of you guys out there who are in the good fight. Um, next book. Exit West. Um, we are going male author. Um, this is from Moshin Hamid. Um, again, I don't know that much about this book. I really should do more research. But I, I love not knowing about what I'm going to read. I hate... Once I've read a book, I like to read some reviews and things. and But... Um, I really like to be surprised. So I go often on the recommendation of bookstore owners, bookstore staff, or people who I know. And actually somebody on Instagram, on one of our other posts, um, recommended this book. And then I saw it, uh, I saw it in um, the bookstore. So I was like, let's do that one. Um, so you guys, I apologize for my tiredness tonight and my sort of scattiness. Um, it's always amazing and I really appreciate the time that you guys give and it's so lovely to sort of read something with a bunch of you um, and I yeah write some more comments because I love reading those as well. All right, have a safe and lovely night and take care of each other, take care of yourselves and um, let's talk, this would be, let's talk the first week of December. All right, thank you so much, bye. And I don't know how to turn it off, there we go.